Okay. So, it was never my dream or my intention to become an artist. The art world didn't really appeal to me. I kind of felt like it was confined and too specific. And so I avoided art and kind of pursued everything else. What I really wanted to do was work with people. Um, and I kind of distracted myself from making art because of the world that I presumed that art inhabited. And then when I got to college, I took a class, uh, Drawing One, and I was stuck with the dilemma of loving it. And I knew that I was going to need to fit, find a way to make this be my life. Art means a lot of different things to many different people. And to me, what I found in the past 10 years of making murals is that murals can serve to not only in disenfranchised communities, but in all, over, all different kinds of communities um, create dialogue. And sometimes the dialogue can happen between groups of people who have been separated and need to be in communication. Sometimes it can happen with groups of people who are meeting for the first time. So today I'm going to share a few of those projects with you. The first thing that I realized that I loved about mural painting was the engagement with the community and the collaboration. All of these projects are collaborative. Collaborative with teenage girls, with Brownsville Community Mural Project in Brooklyn, collaborative with Appalachian school children and war veterans in rural Tennessee, collaborative with immigrant mothers in Sunset Park, with homeless teenagers in New York City, with members of the Zapatista Army in Chiapas, Mexico, preschoolers in Detroit, and incarcerated mothers at Rikers Island. Every project has a theme, and the community members, the people who are working on the project, are often also the subject of the art. So the people who are members of the community are able to be the creators of the visual media that represents them. So whether it's a housing occupation in Barcelona, or a classroom curriculum, or teaching philosophies in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, the people who are the subject of the art get to decide what it is that they want to communicate about their community, what it is that they feel best defines their message, and how they want to, in the end, speak for themselves and represent themselves. Every topic has a um, theme, and around that theme, communities can be built. So for example, in this project, um, this was a ground project that I did with a group of teenage girls in Sunset Park, and the theme was women in the military and the wartime exploitation of inner city youth. So around the, just this specific topic, we had our community that was geographic, located by the mural. We had the community that was topical, around the same subject, and then an online community, too. So the girls would build dialogue with their friends and their peer groups. Um, we had lots of news coverage online. And then we were able to connect with other organizations that do the same kind of work around the same kind of topic. So collaborating with the community, in a way, can make arts expression broaden exponentially just because of the nature of the work. One thing that I loved about this kind of art too, this kind of art and dialogue, was that it can bring people together for the first time. So in 2007, I had gotten invited to Santiago de Cuba, uh, Cuba's second largest city, to have an exhibit. Um, when I had been the year before, and my students, fourth through eighth graders from Ballet Tech, the New York City Public School for Dance, were really curious about Cuba. They were like, Ms. Yamasaki, what are the kids like? What's Cuba like? What are the schools like? And a lot of them, their, their basic understanding of Cuba was that it was very poor and communist. So they had a middle school level understanding of communism combined with a general kind of familiarity with the Caribbean as many of them were Dominican, West Indian, Puerto Rican. So um, similarly mis and underinformed, the Cuban kids thought that people in the United States were very predominantly blonde and blue-eyed, and that um, New York City, especially Brooklyn, was a very dangerous, violent place to live. So I felt like a dialogue was in order. I asked my students to um, create a postcard, to kind of write and illustrate a postcard describing themselves and what their life is like in New York. And then when I got to Cuba, I had made 31 paintings of these students in the world that they inhabited, the world that they called home. And I displayed the paintings in the gallery in Cuba. And through the course of the exhibit, hundreds of Cuban kids came through the gallery to kind of walk around and find the New York City kid to whom they most closely identified. And then once they did, they, the Cuban kids created a response postcard kind of describing who they are and what their life is like in Cuba. So when I got back to New York after the show, I made a, another collection of paintings of the Cuban kids kind of in the world that they described as home. I chose this age because I feel like with adolescence, it's kind of a 
moment where identity is wildly important and extremely fluid. So one day a student will come to me and they'll be like, Ms. Yamasaki, I'm going to be an architect. And then the next day they come and they're saying, actually, I'm going to be a rapper or a gymnast veterinarian. And they have so many different opinions about themselves and it's changing so rapidly that I felt like it was a good time to take a look at their identity and include into that kind of mix uh, the idea of global, global citizenship. So, for example, Cyrus wrote, Hello, my name is Cyrus. I live in the Bronx and I like to watch the birds in the morning when I walk to the bus. My favorite animals are tigers, monkeys, and bears because although they are vicious creatures, they all have a soft side when they get close to, an, uh, to a human. Um, I am the only vegetarian in my family. What are your favorite animals? So Adrian in Cuba, he replied to Cyrus kind of describing the Cuban countryside and describing what his favorite animals were in Cuba with hopes that Cyrus one day would come back and visit him and visit, meet the animals of Cuba. There were so many dialogues that began, dialogues about food and about family, dialogues about brothers and artwork and rabbits and pets, basketball, and the conga. Whitney wrote, hola Cuban kid, my name is Whitney, and I love New York City because there is so much shopping. Food stores, clothes stores, 99 cent stores, but New York is also bad because a lot of people get killed. But besides that, New York is great. And, he, and I kind of paused with this postcard because I thought, okay, people in Cuba may not really identify neither with the shopping nor the violent crime, but it was a good place for me to check my own assumptions because uh, Edgar replied and he wrote, um, I also love shopping, and the shopping was the, um, Santiago was the shopping capital of eastern Cuba. This is the same city that I had to go to the hospital to get blisters on my feet treated because there were no band-aids for sale. But it's all, it was all relative. And he also wrote to Whitney that he was very sorry about all the killings. Xavier wrote about boardwalks and playing football in parking lots, and Roberto Carlos replied about one day wanting to become a great painter. Carla and Gabriela both wrote about peace. Lydia wrote about being Buddhist and her pets, and Elizabeth replied talking about um, her drawings and her school friends. Tamara wrote to Katia saying she had nieces the same age as Katia, and once this whole thing was over, that she hoped that Katia would be able to come down and meet her nieces in person. When I came back from Cuba, I was invited to do a residency in Chiapas, Mexico, and I found my way into a women's prison um, wh where a social worker told me that the vast majority of the women who were incarcerated there had been incarcerated for killing their husbands in self-defense. So I worked with them and with their children who stayed with them up until four years old. Um, this project was only a week-long project, but it kind of struck me in a way that was very unexpected. Uh, a lot of the women spoke to me about their painful past, past that were riddled with violence, and their hopes for the future. Um, a lot of them spoke about the hopes of reuniting with their family, but all of the women talked to me about the fear and the stress and the strain about being separated from their children, the children that are older than four that are living out in Mexican society someplace with their family or foster family. And I started to wonder, what happens to you as a, as a mother, as a woman, when you are separated from your child and taken to jail? And then what happens to you as a child, to your development, to your sense of self, to your spiritual well-being, when, you when your mother is taken away from you and sent to prison? And how can art act as a bridge builder between these groups of incarcerated mothers and children? So around this time last year, I um, created a project called If Walls Could Talk, and I launched a Kickstarter campaign. Um, to fund it. And I was working with incarcerated mothers at Rikers Island and their children in East Harlem. Um, I, asked the, oops, I asked the mothers and the children to kind of create artwork um, for the other, dedicated to the other, that could express whatever they wanted it to express. Mostly they expressed kind of dreams for the future, hopes for the present, and sorrow over the past. I was partnered with an agency called STEPS to End Family Violence, and this partnership was really essential because not only did STEPS connect me with the mothers and the children, but they also really helped when it came to grounding the artwork that they were doing in the therapeutic and social work that some of them already had underway in the jail. 
One of the nine-year-old boys wrote to his mother, it makes me sad that you're away because I can't see you every day and know that you're okay. I think one thing that moved me the most about this project was seeing how just the process of art making was so deeply therapeutic in and of itself. When you take the stigma of being an incarcerated mother and being separated from your children or being a child and having a mother who's incarcerated, when you take that stigma off the table, there was so much room for expression and, um, and real dialogue. So the first mural that we painted, this mural was designed by the children in workshops and then painted inside of the jail, inside of the Rosam Singer Center at Rikers Island. Um, the children wanted to express how they keep their mothers present in their heart even during the separation. This was painted across the hallway from the nursery where babies up until one years old stay with their mother in the jail. And it's about, it's a detail of a 54 foot mural. While we were painting, um, the dialogue around the mural grew, and a lot of what they, the children wanted to express were memories from the past, hopes for the future, and just the kind of constant idea of their mother being with them. So one of the, the kites in the sky came from one of the four-year-olds who participated, and he wrote that his mother is beautiful like a flying diamond. The second mural was painted in East Harlem, and this was painted with the children, designed by the mothers. So the mothers also wanted to express that they are, despite the separation, maintaining a constant loving bond with their children, despite the chains and the walls, that they are always with them. So they chose to represent themselves as separate islands from the children. And the islands are kind of surrounded by rings of water that have lullabies written into them and also have some statistical information about maternal incarceration. So the kind of data helped to really ground the um, help to ground the, emotion, the mother's emotional expression in statistics, which some people really need to see. Um, again, the kites and the drawings all kind of express the same thing, uh, the mother's um, regrets, the mother's hopes, and the mother's constant loving bond to the kids. Every day that we were working, that I was working in the jail, the mothers would go back to their cells and work on more drawings, work on more kind of sketches and poetry, and they'd bring them back every single day, and they'd also bring with them notes from other inmates that would say, can I please come and join the mural group? And there was such a need and such a desire for this release of expression. One of the, one of the mothers said, art is a great form of expression. So many individuals in jail have anger built up because they cannot express themselves freely um, or effectively. Art can bring light to the darkest places. What I found when we were working was that, I don't know what just happened to my slideshow. Oh, okay, sorry. What I found that when we were working was that uh, the community that kind of surrounded the mural uh, grew and grew. And the community was the, they were the passing inmates on either side as they walked past the image. And they were also the corrections officers. So a lot of the mothers talked about this need to numb themselves against the pain they were feeling. And what we saw were a lot of the mothers when they would come through and talk about the mural and talk about their children, they would kind of crack through that numbness because they wanted to connect. And the corrections officers started to kind of relate to the inmates in a way that was not just as inmates, but they were relating to them also as mothers. Um, the, in a way, the mural provided a space where, um, where we could have a more human experience in spite of the extreme sensory and emotional deprivation that is jail. So in East Harlem, the engagement with the community was unlike anything I had ever experienced while painting, and, I, and I'm positive it has to do with the theme. So many families, children, um, police officers, local business owners, the formerly incarcerated, homeless people, kids, they would come by because they wanted to stand in front of the mural and have their picture taken in solidarity with the mother's message. At two different instances, I had a police officer and the local gang leader from that block come by and tell me that they were posting the entire mural project on Instagram. Um, and I think that what all of this leads me to think about is just that when it comes to art, and just when it comes to this moment in society, we have so many ways, more than ever, ways to be connected, yet there are so many people who are left feeling disconnected. There is such unrealized potential for art to be something that brings us together to connect us. And this kind of work depends on the artist's complete integration into all nooks and crannies of society where we recognize that the art world and the regular world are actually the same place. And it is up to the artist to make this be the case.
Thank you.